Welcome to Gwent Game Theory episode number three. Today we're going to talk about bronze cards. So the long and short of bronze cards is every card should somehow equal the number eight or greater. What the hell does that mean? Well, look at the Redanian Knight. He has eight strength. He has achieved the level of eightness. In Gwent, since there are no restrictions to what you can play or when you can play it, then all bronze cards have a baseline value, and it happens to be around eight. All silver cards have a baseline value. All gold cards have a baseline value. The values get a little mur murky once you venture into different types of cards, such as disloyals and stuff. It's harder to quantify them. Cards that sort through your deck, like Thaler, are a little bit more weird. But bronze cards are pretty easy to understand. You want your total contribution to the game to be around 8 or be within range of justifying it as providing 8 strength. So the Blue Stripe Scout... Adds four strength to the battlefield on his own and four green strength onto a unit on your battlefield. Eight. Kedwenny Seed Support. Two strength, but three two times on top of that. Eight. Vreehead Dragoon. Five strength and three green to a non-gold in your hand. Eight. Fiend. Eight. Okay, but you get the point. I could do this all day. So... There are some cards that just straight up represent the value of eight. And that means that they're achieving what's average what's expected of a bronze card now you may ask yourself what about cards that don't achieve eight immediately on play how do they get there so a card like the ancient fog that comes into play as a six but immunity to fog is a value ability immunity to any weather is a value ability because you are more durable than other units would be and gaining one strength is the secondary ability of the ancient foglet so this card you can reasonably in your head say would it be worthwhile to skip out on the Fiend to use an Ancient Foglet? Do they end up being around the same value in the run of normal play? How much do I want to account for durability in terms of the strength added to the unit? And yeah, you'd say Ancient Foglet meets the criteria, maybe even slightly better in the long run. And then when you look at Skelliger cards, you have to remember that the number on the card itself, like for example, Light Longship is saying 7 strength, is only the strength for round one. So this is actually seven, eight, nine with immunity to range. So this is a card that over the course of a game is going to have plus value of our number eight. So with that knowledge and knowing that the number eight is very important, we were looking for cards to include in decks, of course, based on the situation and the circumstance and the structure of the deck that can exceed that value. And row buffers like the Hawker Healer can pretty readily exceed eight in terms of value. For example, a Hawker Healer needs to be placed on a row with three units, and the Hawker Healer represents 11 strength. So the Hawker Healer has great upward mobility from that baseline value. The same can be said of the clan Heime Scald. He adds two strength to other non-golds in the row. So he just needs to find a row that has three other units in it, and kapow, there you go. You're getting great value from this card. So there's a lot of potential in cards like this to exceed what you'd expect. Now, these are circumstantial expectations, though. You need to have three units on a row to achieve that. If a Scald or a Hawker Healer come into play with nothing else in play, then these cards are underwhelming and you're losing value. Speaking of cards that lose value when nothing else is in play, BMC. Then there are some cards that have a lesser circumstance to attain greater value. For example, the Shieldsmith is a great one. He comes into play as a 789 for Skellige if you include his added base strength. But if you play a Shieldsmith in round one and you add your two base strength to a unit that you're going to play not only in round one, but maybe you'll res him in round two and maybe round three then his buff is essentially six strength throughout the course of the game because you're getting its value each turn. So you could justifiably value a turn one shieldsmith at 11 strength if you're going to continuously res the target, which is why when you play shieldsmith, you want to try and put your strength on a unit that you could feasibly bring back each turn. Sometimes 
we work around this by putting strength on units that bring themselves back each turn, like Morkvarg or Old Gear. Other times, we put it on Freyas that are going to come back into play. We put it on Sig, who's going to come back into play. Put it on the Skirmishers, who are going to be here often, or the Queen's Guard are going to be here often. That is how you maximize value for a card like Shieldsmith. So at this point, I think I've said the number 8 enough to convince you all that you're looking for an 8 out of a unit, or out of any bronze play. Even bronze specials constitute 8. That's a little bit more complex. Maybe we'll talk about it sometime, but they do. Just trust me on this one. So look at this Reaver Scout. If each individual unit constitutes a value in some way, shape, or form, or should, then a Reaver Scout being played for three strength and pulling out an additional unit, that means that this three strength unit is pulling out an eight strength, eight, eight value unit from your deck. And the act of pulling a card out of your deck is also a valued action. So if you're wondering why you're seeing so many Reaver Scouts right now, they are amazing. And the same can be said about Elven Mercs. Elven Mercenaries are a three strength unit that pull out a special, which is minimum eight strength because they can actually play silver specials, which are more than eight. And I'm going to keep interchanging eight strength and value because I'm doing it on the fly. But you understand what I'm saying. So they can pull out a bronze special, which would be eight value. They can pull out a silver special, which exceeds eight value. And that has more variable nature depending on what the circumstance is. Like, for example, sometimes Elven Mercs can first play pull out a nature's gift and get absolutely zero value. And it's actually a negative in most cases. Other times the Elven Merc can pull out a decoy when Yaven has been played to your side of the battlefield. And that is phenomenal. Like, that's exceeding because not only are you getting your extra card advantage from using a decoy you're getting additional card advantage from using a decoy on a card that provides card advantage so you can really do great things with elven mercs of course conditional on the rng but then of course elven mercs are coupled with the card first light and first light is important because of the rally ability so first light's value is represented in whatever they rally out of your deck assuming you're using it for rally which is going to happen most of the time so it's not as if you're getting double value from an elven merc pulling first light and then the first light pulling the unit not really how it works but the value that you are getting is the super thinning of the deck because when the elven merc casts first light first light comes out of your deck if we're at a full deck that means our deck goes from 15 to 14. when the first light pulls a bronze unit from your deck your deck is now down to 13 cards. If the chain continues with a Blue Mountain Commando or with another Elven Merc, you can easily get your deck down six cards. And the cards that you're taking out of your deck with First Light and Rally are bronze cards, which you do not want to draw. So you are doing yourself a favor through this process. The same is similar with the Reaver Scouts, but the Reaver Scouts don't really have the super chain possibilities that the Elven Mercs do. And that's what's providing such great consistency to a lot of Scoia'tael decks right now. So in review, we want to look through our cards, look through the bronze cards and find cards that can exceed the value of eight. Eight is our baseline. If you're below eight, we don't even wanna to talk to you. Looking at you, Dunbanner White Cav. And we want to use those cards to their maximum utility. We want to create situations where we can get exceedingly good value from our bronze cards because then we can use more situational silver cards. We can try and leverage card advantage more often with silver cards. We can use the silver cards to help in the process of thinning our deck. We could throw back golds into our deck. We can use Johnny to try and get fifth gold throughout the process of the game. So it's really important to be able to understand the value of your bronze cards and what they're doing, why they're doing it. This way you're getting maximum value out of them. This has been Gwent Game Theory, Episode 3 on HG3. Thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you guys next time. Make sure to like, subscribe, and check out our live streams on Twitch TV. The links will be in the description. Have a great new year. Peace out.